<laughs> nice. Shorter. <laughs> Look at you guys. I, I was thinking of wearing a hat. I knew you guys would have hats on. We always have hats. It's just the buzz. He's got, it. you got to, what do you got? He, he's got the start of a mullet going on. So whatever we can do to hide my buzz, his mullet, you know, nice. that's what we do. How, how's the bicep, man? That was a it nasty hurts. picture. It's, it's a little, it's a little wow. black and blue. So that's it's nasty. all right though. Fortunately, it's just muscle instead right. of um, no tendons, no ligaments, nothing like that. Right. It's all muscle stuff. So I think it will recover pretty quickly. It, all, it actually feels a lot better two days later. So good. Good. Well, good. Hey, listen, uh, just uh, full transparency. Recognize to me. I don't think we've ever talked. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've been following you online vicariously through your dad. I'm not a stalker, uh, but uh, I, I, I hit your dad up before I even knew you guys were, you were going to start a podcast. And this is weird serendipity. I was thinking about this this morning, thinking about uh, things we're going to talk about and why I wanted to do this, because I've got a selfish reason for doing this. I think I shared that uh, with you, Ryan, when I initially hit you up, in that um, I'm a pseudo famous dad, like your dad is. And, uh, and my son grew up in my shadows. And he was, he was known as Tony's son. And I never, and I might start to cry right now when I think about this, because I am uh, inspired by your relationship with your dad and Ryan, what you've done. And, and my goal with this talk is one is when we release, share the very first uh, podcast, Man in the Making, that you guys did. I was blown away by uh, how, how you're, you sound more mature than your dad. Uh, at, at, <laughs> um and, and I want to, I feel like, like I'm a good dad and I care and I love my family, but there's things that I'm seeing you do, Ryan, with your family that, that blow my mind and I can't go back in time. I feel, I feel guilt. Like I said, I might cry. Uh, my kids know I love them, but what you guys are doing is amazing. And and I just want to share that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we're excited to do this. We've been excited to yeah. do it. And, you know, you and I are friends. We've known each other for years now. And like, man, to be able to join you and talk about this stuff, like this is what we want. You know, yeah. we, we, Breck and I have talked about it a lot. Like these are the things that we want to talk about. These are the conversations we want to have. We want to connect with awesome people. You know, the other cool thing is like when I was a kid, man, I didn't, I didn't know how to connect with people. Like I didn't know who, who I could connect with or who I should be talking with, but um, I I know it sounds weird, but I wish I had the advantage that this kid has when I was a kid. Um, And, you know, I, that sounds weird because it's like, okay, I'm, I I might be the one to, to a degree providing that advantage, but that that's the cool thing is as a father is that you can create for your son and your daughter what you wish you would have had as a kid in fact that's your responsibility like what you what you should have had you should provide right right i i I agree and and uh in many ways you know my 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 son nick i got two girls uh who are doing really well and uh hang on (laughs) i got can you guys hear that drilling outside yeah we can hear it yeah um I don't, the, Tony, uh, are you using an outside microphone or what, what are you using for a microphone? I'm using a, a Yeti mic, a really good one. But uh, um, okay. I just wasn't sure if it was picking up that microphone or not. Yeah. The uh, okay. usually the, my audio is really good, but uh, you move outside. I, I got, I forgot we've got uh, some construction going on under the house. And they're drilling things right out here, and they could do it over there. Um, uh, sorry about this. It's all good. I I Brecken got a message, a, a very, um, how would you how would you he got a very Quite aggressive aggressive that's <laughs> the way, aggressive message from me last week about like shut the hell up and <laughs> like turn off all the music or whatever you guys are doing and stop yelling at each other down yeah. there just the other day. Yeah, so. I was playing the electric guitar. That's what it was. <laughs> he messaged you were me trying to record? Come get, 
I was trying to record and he was upstairs jamming right. on the electric guitar. I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to is, get on a podcast. Yeah. Is my, I'm just going to check something here. Uh, yeah, I've got the right, I got everything okay. on right here. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, there's a, like a, a, like a buzz saw going on outside every so often, and, which I didn't no know. I didn't. But anyways, um, uh, anyways, we were saying back, back, back to the, uh, the, you know, what we were talking about is providing your kids with things that you didn't have if you can, <clears throat> and finding that balance between <clears throat> uh, handing it to them and, and having them maybe miss earning it or understanding its value. Uh, and, uh, and, and I loved, uh, uh, I, I loved how Breck and you invested money in building your website and stuff like that. It wasn't just, oh yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up. You know, your dad just hooking you up and, and, and this and that. And those are things, again, you can't, you can't go back. I think those are some uh, little mistakes I made with my kids because I was on the road so much building my business that I would come home and be like, I got you this and I got you this and I did this and I did this and we're going here and uh, there's got to be a balance there and I, I'm, not, I'm not the role models my goal is I've got a, uh, no doubt a lot of uh, you know most of my audience as 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 your dad knows military law enforcement martial artists uh, fitness nuts and and I'm assuming a lot of them are or will be dads and the opportunity to share your your story both your stories and turn them on to if they're already not listening to order man, but man in the making and, uh, and start that everyone's got to find their own balance, you know, you know, the, the, uh, for real, what is work life balance? It, it's, it's what you make it of it. And you, and you find out, I guess, as you go through chapters in your life, whether you kind of screwing up and dialing things in a little bit more, <clears throat> like, uh, like you found out Ryan, um, that, uh, resisting on that arm bar or whatever it was that <laughs> was it an arm bar that, it did it? No, everybody thinks it was an arm bar, which is totally understandable. Um, I, I actually had a buddy of mine, my training partner in side control. Okay. And I, I ba look, long story short, I basically tried to butterfly a 200 pound man uh -huh. with my left arm. <laughs> and my arm said, nah, we're not doing that. And just went pop and, and gave. So um, it wasn't an arm bar. It, it was... <laughs> Yeah. It was, just, it was ego, like an arm bar would be like, I'm not going to get submitted. Right. <laughs> so it was definitely ego, but I'm like, no, I can lift this guy up. And yeah. my body said, no, you actually can't lift this guy up. Let me prove it to you. So, and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, and it's, and it's funny because as you know, the mind navigates the body and we do things and then our, our body will let us know dramatically. Like, no, that was, <laughs> totally. that was, that was too much weight or that was too yep. much of an angle, but um, that's and, right. Very cool. Um, so, so my agenda, I think I've, I've clearly stated my agenda, uh, with this is really to share your story, share your message, uh, and, and have people get inspired by a relationship. I was, how, Brecken, how old are you now? I'm 14. I just barely turned 14 in March. Okay. Very cool. Um, the, uh, you're, you're, you've probably heard this. If you haven't, you're, you're very lucid for a 14 year old. I don't know if you know what lucid means. I used a, a, that, that big uh, uh, obscure word uh, on purpose because there was some banter in the podcast with your dad. Uh, my, fav my, <laughs> my favorite, favorite line was Ryan, you said something, I don't remember what it was. And Brecken goes, uh-huh, or something like that. And you go, that's it, uh-huh. And then, and then you quote Jocko. You go <laughs> one word, good. Like, like, and it was so, so you're very, the osmosis, another big word of being around some of these great minds that your, your, your dad has, has, has created this environment for both him and for you. And it's, it's serendipity, right? It's not, it's not a, um, using a lot of big words today. It's very impressive guys. Mark that down three big words in one paragraph. Um, <laughs> The, the uh, you know, Ryan, I didn't know, I, like, I know you enough, you know, we've spoken, I've, you, we've been on each other's podcasts and, and we've spoken several times. I know you enough that, that 
well, you, you are a capitalist and you want to be successful. You don't do this shit for money. And, and you didn't set out like order of man and meeting people going, I wonder what the ROI will be on this in terms of, of, yeah. of business. But what amazing, there's a term I heard uh, probably 20 years ago called intellectual capital. And I always loved it. Intellectual capital is the wealth of your experience. Mm. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and that's what I, that's kind of the, 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 the vibe I'm getting with, with everything here uh, with you guys. Um, for people who don't know who you are, uh, Ryan, what's your elevator speech? You're locked in an elevator and, and what, what do you, what do you tell, hey, what do you, you know, what do you tell people? Yeah, I mean, if people ask, what do I do or who I, who, who am I? You know, I I usually lead with I'm a husband, um, I'm a father to not only Brecken, but I've got three other kids as well. Uh, it's weird because you don't hear a lot about them because Brecken and I are uh, so involved with this organization and what we're doing, and we're on very similar paths. But <laughs> I love my kids, my other kids that you don't hear a lot about just as equally. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, I'm the I'm the founder and owner of Order of Man. So, really, my goal over the past seven years is to get myself, primarily myself, on the right track as a as a father, a husband, a business owner, a community leader, just a man in general. Um, and and I figured it would be a great way for me to share other valuable insight from successful men like yourself. Uh, we've had other fascinating and incredible individuals on our podcast. And we've been doing that for seven years. And then my son, my oldest son, Brecken, uh, has expressed interest in what I do. And I thought, you know, it'd be really cool if we put something together where you and I, Brecken, talk about some of these issues, whether it's drugs and sex and pornography and uh, girls and, and business and politics and religion, like all of the conversations that dads don't want to have with their sons. Right. That we've been having now for 14 years. <laughs> and, and I think it's awkward sometimes between us, but also we've become pretty accustomed to having these types of conversations and what, what he, the type of conversations that he's used to having, I don't know that his peers would be totally comfortable with. I, yeah. I, number one, I don't think they would get it. Number two, I think they would be awkward about it. Like even this afternoon, my, I was downstairs and I was having uh, lunch and my wife was in there and he was in there and, you know, I was, I was hugging up on my wife and, you know, being, being physically intimate to, you know, an appropriate way, of course. Right. And, you know, he doesn't want to see that necessarily, but at the same time, like he needs to see that he needs to see a man be physically connected with his wife. And so all of his buddies are probably all grossed out. And he's like, nah, this is just dad and mom being, yeah. being connected and being intimate together. And the, it's not inappropriate. I'm not saying that, by yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but he sees that kind of stuff and he's used to the conversations that most men would, you know, shy away from. So this is a powerful opportunity for us to connect in a meaningful way, but also for me to share valuable insight with my son, for him to ask good questions, for him to, lead conversations but then i started thinking about it too with your peers mm -hmm. they're only going to listen to me so much like brecken's only going to listen to me so much to a degree but he's also going to start listening to his peers and he's got friends he talks about them every day and they hold weight with him and i could say well that shouldn't be the case or i could say no that is the case so let me try to influence not only my son but try to influence other young men so that we can put these young boys on the right path for success in the future. And that's where Man in the Making was born. I, I, I dig it. And it's so huge because what we're, what we're not doing, like I've got a really, really, as I mentioned earlier, I've got three kids. And my youngest daughter, who's 20, is super, super smart. Uh, she's uh, studying like, you know, physics and chemistry and it's like shit. She comes home with homework and I'm like, let me know if you need some help with that, praying that she doesn't, because I have no idea what she's doing, right? Like, <laughs> Definitely. I'm like, you know, and she's going, she shows me stuff and I'm going, hmm, yeah. And, but I'm like going, I have no clue. Like, it's so complicated. Definitely. Right? And, uh, and, and I say this because I know she'll never watch like this <laughs> interview. Um, 
you know, like out of the blue, she I say, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going over to the store here when you meet us. She's all, I'm, I'm boycotting this today because it's anti da da da. And I'm like, like some like weird activist bullshit. And I know the only, I turned to my wife and I went, the only place she would get that is through her peers and at school, right? And, and, uh, and so in some circular way, I want to come back. The fact that you are cultivating this relationship, and I know that, you know, while people know Brecken because he's forward facing, he's, he's in front commercially for people, uh, those conversations, I know you as a dad and the trips and stuff like that, you're cultivating this type of self-awareness uh, and, and this uh, a family that converses and discusses things. And what I see as a dad from afar is you're, you're inspiring thinking, critical thinking, and you're sharing values and what that'll change, and Brecken might not even know it to the degree that it will happen, but when he's 15 or 16, he starts to drive and he's out, he's gonna know way in advance that this is a bad choice, or this is a conversation that needs to stop here, or I need to assert, right? And so it's planting seeds way in advance because the big one of the biggest problems here, our world right now, is parents are completely absent. And now we've got kids that have zero boundaries. They think everyone gets a prize. And, and that if you cry and pout and you have, and you demand a safe space, the world's gonna, you know, the world owes you a living. So, so, you know, I know I'm rambling it a little bit, but I think that's huge what you're doing with, uh, there's that buzzing again. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, it's, it's huge what you're doing with the kids. Because as they go out with their peers and do stuff, Brecken's going to know and your other kids are going to know. And hopefully what, what, what I see is that leadership will happen through you, Brecken, where someone's about to do some stuff and you're almost now going, hey, guys, it, be, before we strike this match and <laughs> set this shit on fire, let's talk about this, right? Um, so let me let me turn this over to you. Uh, um, I think it's cool, Brecken. So you're stuck in an elevator with somebody, and it's the same question for your dad. It's like, hey, uh, like, who are you? What do you do? Yeah. So me and my dad have always had a really strong bond together since since I was three, four years old. We've always just had a special bond together. So we're using this to give young men the skill sets that they need to have during their life. So if they don't have a father figure in their life that they can look to us, a father son relationship and get those conversations from us. And just like my dad was saying, um, it's good to hear from your dad, but also your peers. One of my coach football coaches would say, um, it's going to mean more coming from one of your teammates than coming from me. So I feel like they can relate more to me saying it than my dad. So we're, we're, we're comfortable sharing these conversations and I'm very fortunate to be able to have a loving father and mother under a house and he's able to take me on trips and I'm able to have conversations with great people and meet great people. So why not use that to, to share with people? That's amazing and, and, and very um, uh, mature and, and evolved for your age again. Uh, that that you want to do that and i think it's huge i don't know you know other than like the squire program and a couple of other uh uh programs out there uh, which and, and in many ways those aren't accessible to a lot of people there's yeah. the geography there's the finances uh, uh there's the fear uh but podcasts are free and you can consume it right it's it's nutrition for your mind and there's no there's no excuse to not listen to a podcast whether you're on a walk or going to bed or driving to work or whatever. And, and, and hopefully I know from my side, uh, I've got 14 or 15,000 organic on my list. It's not huge, but, but it's a, it's a legit list. And so many of them are parents or no parents and, uh, um, they'll listen to this and hopefully it'll inspire other people to have 
those conversations because I've been there. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody about anything, but I can remember many things, many times where my wife has said, you need to talk to Nick or Madison about this. And I'm like, yeah, no, like that's really, you need to talk. <laughs> and you're like, you're doing that dance, not realizing how ironic it is. I can get up on stage in front of 500 people and talk about anything, you know? Uh, and then now it's you and your family and you're, you're allowing an unconscious fear redirect an important conversation. Um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it is the conversations that we have, not just on the podcast, but in our day-to-day -day interaction it is, can be very uncomfortable at times. And so I, I think one thing that fortunately I've, I've learned or at least done relatively well over the past several years is that realizing that it's not about my discomfort, it's about his level of success. And it's about my other children's level of success. And sometimes that means, well, let me say it this way. I think a lot of parents will withhold conversations and instruction and guidance and direction, not because they're not worried about their kids, but because they're more worried about themselves. Agreed. So if I have to have a conversation, for example, with Brecken at 14 years old, just barely 14 years old about sex, that may be an uncomfortable conversation, but whose, whose feelings and, and whose best interest am I looking after in that moment of saying, I'm not going to have that conversation? Well, it's not his. Right. I'm, I'm looking after myself and it's very selfish for me to say, yeah, I don't know if he's ready for that. I don't want to have that conversation. That's a selfish pursuit. Sure. That's a selfish motive. But if on the other hand, I say, you know, I'm uncomfortable talking with him about what sexual intercourse actually is and the weight behind it, but he needs to hear it as a 14 year old, then I need to let go of my own fear and I need to let go of my own um, self-preservation and realize that it ain't about me. It's about him. And if at 14 years old, you know, where he's hitting his hormones and he's starting to find young ladies attractive. And I'll throw this out here. I won't use details, but we were on a trip in, in Mexico and he found a cute little, a cute little thing in Mexico. And she was very attractive. She's a cute little, a, a young lady. And, you know, he's attracted to her. I'm like, yeah, right. That's, that's natural. And that's good and true. And if I can't equip him with what he needs to be able to know how to harness those emotions, how to harness those hormones raging through his body, then that's a failure of, of mine, not a failure of his. And so right. I need to not be selfish and try to preserve my own comfort level and realize that, okay, I got to be uncomfortable to be, and also make him uncomfortable because he doesn't want to talk about, I'll be kind of crude here, but like, he doesn't want to talk about penises and vaginas with his dad. Okay. Right. But like, those are the conversations that we need to have so that he's equipped mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, to be able to make good decisions in spite of what his body is doing to himself right now. So right. it's, it's a challenge, but it's crucial. And it's something that I just, unfortunately, a lot of parents aren't willing to do. Yeah. Brian, let me ask you something there, because you're, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a friend, but I'm also a fan, right? You know, I, I comment on your posts, I'll, 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 I reshare them, and that's what I mean by a fan, you know, uh, and, and uh, I'm a fan of your mind. Where, where did this clarity and, and discipline and focus come from for you because it's it's so consistent it's one of the things i think i've i've, I've shared with you a couple of times is how your 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 writing and your consistency and your messaging has it's not deviated since you launched but it's gotten so tight and 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 so sniper sharp you know not gatling gun all over the place and and uh uh do you feel like, like this is like, if you asked me, why do you think about self-defense and violence? And then it's, it's like, I wake up in the middle of the night writing down drills and I'll try this tomorrow. And like, it's, 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 uh, I remember a, a couple of years ago on a podcast, I was telling someone how passionate I was after talking about my life story. 
And they said, you're not passionate, you're obsessed. And when I heard it, I got defensive right away because obsessed has a negative connotation. And then slowly, like with about 30 seconds, I went, no, I am obsessed. This is all, this is, this is all I do. So like that was a neat reframe and how we're conditioned to think certain words mean this or that. But uh, are you obsessed with this stuff? Like, like fixing men and families and where did that where does that come from because you're again your messaging so tight sniper sharp uh and you don't deviate doesn't matter what the politics are doesn't matter what the cancel culture is telling you. this is like this is it yeah i mean look i i don't i don't i don't know about you i, I would imagine there you, uh, let me let me let me back up. Let me say it this way. I, I think most of us are equipped to do something in life. I, I don't know what it is. I think Tony, you've been very equipped, obviously, in your life to do what it is you do, uh, be, because you you've been obsessed with it. You you've had focus on it. For me, I I grew up without a permanent father figure in my life, and I felt honestly, I felt a little cheated as I was growing up. Like I felt slighted, and and I took it personally, not against like my mom or my father figures, but I was. Uh, against God or, or, uh, just against just, just my, my lot in life. I'm like, what the hell? Like, why didn't I get this? Um, and then when I started having kids, I realized, oh, I got it. I know why I had to deal with that. So they never would like my kids are never barring my death and that's it. It could be divorce. It could be a, a injury. It could be a thousand other things, but barring death, they're never going to wonder if dad's around to be able to be there for them and cares about them and supports them. But that's the, that's the thing I didn't have, man. I had all those kind of questions every single day. Does my dad love me? Does my mom love me? How come he's not here? And then I had another stepfather coming to my life and I'm like, how come he's an asshole? Um, how come he doesn't support what I'm doing? Does he love me? Does he care about me? And then I had another stepfather, you know, like this is what I had to deal with, but I'm grateful now, not at the time. I remember nights as a young boy crying myself, literally crying myself to sleep, wondering what was wrong with me. Mm. They're never going to have to wonder that. Like they'll have issues. Like we all do. We're human right. beings. They'll have things they got to work through and, and, and struggles and challenges and adversity. That ain't going to be one of them. Right. Mark my words. And I'll be damned if that's one of the issues they have to deal with. So my passion comes from my past experience. And I never want these four kids to be in the experience that I was wondering if their dad loves them. That's right. where my passion comes from. That's where my clarity comes from. That's where the focus is. And so everything that I do is revolved around fixing the injustice. And it is an injustice that I had to deal with as a young man. And then I look around in society today and I see millions and millions of young men who are in the same boat or worse than I had it. I look around and I see the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of men who are connected with the Order of Man podcast. And they're like, yeah, I never had a dad either. Right. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to give you tools and resources and guidance and direction and, and be damned with all the distractions and all the, 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 the entertainment and the things that try to take us off of what's important. And I'm not saying this is the most important thing. What I am saying is this is the most important thing to me. Self-defense is the most important thing to you, right? It, it, I've got a good friend, Pete Roberts, the founder of Origin. Uh, they make boots and geese and rash guards and, and jeans, and they're coming out with a hunt line. The most important thing to him right now is to build and bring back American manufacturing. That's not my mission. I support him. I think that's a great mission. That's his mission. Yeah. Like he's found that calling and all of us need to find whatever that calling is and step fully into it, regardless of what the critics and the, and, and the cheerleaders and the, and the, and the, the people on the sidelines will say about us that that has no relevance on what my mission is. This is my mission. I I've seen to a degree, not the most, not the highest degree, but I've seen to a degree what it's like on the opposite side of the equation. And that's not something I'm willing to tolerate. Not at all. So I have to throw my hat in the ring and do something about it. I love it. And, and what's interesting is while you were saying that, um, I was thinking about how many absentee fathers there are in homes where they're still with their kids, meaning like they don't know you're, you're those of you listening, 
you, you know, you, you, you hear and you go, okay, that's for like all the families where the dad disappeared, something happened young or they left. But th this problem is probably a hundred times bigger because in the last 30, 40 years, uh, parents have gotten uh, so selfish in, you know, with, uh, and I'm not saying they shouldn't have a career. This is a, one of my favorite quotes that got me through the eighties because when I, my son, Nick was from a previous relationship and I got full custody of him when he was three months old, which was unheard of. I lived in Canada at the time, but I, I, I fought for that and I had full custody. Here I am a single dad <laughs> with a three month old baby. And, um, and I had that, that same thing as I will, this, this kid will not be without a father. And, uh, um, and I read this, this quote, and I remember having a conversation with my mom because I had a tour of Australia for my, my passion, what I had to do. I wanted to, I wanted to make the world safer. And, and that's not a small, it wasn't like I wanted to open up a karate school at the mall. It was, I want to make the world yeah. safer. And, right. uh, and I remember my mom saying, I was like, said, I said, I, I said, mom, can you help me with Nick? I got to go to wait Australia for a month. And she says, like, no, I can't watch your kid for a month. I can't, I, I, I don't have the time to do that. She said, look, son, this is the choice you made. You can't, you can't do your martial arts stuff and be a single dad. And I remember reading this quote, blew my mind, got goosebumps right now. Nothing affects a child's life more than a parent's unlived life. Mm. Nothing affects a child's life more than a parent's unlived life. And it's a subtle balance because what I've seen, so what I did is I took him to Australia and it was awful. Uh, you know, he's teething. Uh, I didn't know men could <laughs> breastfeed back then. I, I would have breastfed him. That was a joke. <laughs> I'm just joking, right? You guys get that one, right? Well, he gets uh, it. Yeah, he gets right? it. We have these conversations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh i feel my period coming on okay so uh <laughs> so so uh um but you know that changed my bond and my relationship with with my kid right i traveled the world with him for years because i went oh wait a minute no i can do both it's going to be fucking hard but i'm choosing hard you know and and here we go and it was like samurai and son if you remember the old i don't know if you ever saw the old uh samurai movies called there was a series called samurai and Sun. I, I never did i yeah, yeah, they're, they're yeah, bad. I never they're, they're so violent they're crazy but anyways um but but look at that paradigm from my mom i could have very easily gone you're right canceled the tour gotten another job and now i'm miserable and probably uh, uh my son is going to be miserable because that's contagious um and I just, so what I wanted to just, you just, again, made me think about this stuff. And I want all the listeners out there to think, uh, uh, to consider this, that, that there are tons of kids out there, and maybe you were one of them, that even though you had both parents at home, you still didn't get this type of connection, this type of conversation, this type of integrity. And, and I really think that's, that's, uh, what even if i don't even understand what's going on watching youtube listening to the podcast listening to the message it's it's i i could see as my brain i overthink shit <laughs> like, like crazy my fatal flaw um is i could see a lot of people going well that's great well, ryan's successful and he can travel to mexico and of course he's bringing his kid and he's meeting these guys I can't do that. Like, do you get that that type of conversation or energy from people? And how do you try to inspire, you know, where they get jealous and they immediately go to, well, that's easy for you because look what you've done. Are you are tracking yeah, the question I mean, in there? Yeah, no, I know. I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I get that occasionally and I don't care. You know, like I haven't always had it easy. I know my life. You know, my, my wife and I, when he was one years old, in fact, he just learned about this probably what, five, six years ago, yeah. my, my wife and I actually went through a separation, uh, and he was one, one at the time. 
uh, and, and we struggled and I, I had struggles in my early financial planning practice. I would literally wear a dirt path in my backyard in the grass, wondering how I was going to make the damn mortgage and car payment. Um, and I was so stressed out. And then I let that stress pour over, uh, into the relationship with his mother, my wife. Um, so yeah, like when, when people say, well, that's easier said than done. Well, no shit. It's always easier to say things, right, right. you know? And, and, and when people say, oh, well, that's because you have X, Y, and Z, right. Because I've earned X, Y, right. and Z. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Being able to have the luxury of taking my family down to Mexico isn't a luxury that everybody has. And it isn't also a luxury that I've always been able to have, but I've busted my tail to ensure that we're financially successful to the point where if my son says, Hey dad, can we go shoot the bow this afternoon? And I, I can look at my clock and say, you know, it's one thirty-seven right now. Um, yeah. At two fifteen, I can definitely go do that because I don't have another conversation until, you know, four or five o'clock, but, but we've created that, right? Like that wasn't bestowed upon us. Now we've been blessed. I, I'm a godly man. I believe in God. I believe that he wants the best for us. And so he has blessed all of us. Uh, and also he's given me what I need to be able to lead my family and other people successfully. And this starts out with what you talked about earlier um, about the, the, the financial means. And I know you're not doing this for the money. No, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing it for the right reasons. I'm doing it for the motive of serving other men. And I know as Zig Ziglar said, that if you help enough people get what they want, you will inevitably get what you want. And what I want is I want to be able to lead this family. What I want is to be able to take them on experiences that most kids just don't frankly have access to so they can see the world and be exposed to new cultures and new ideas and new concepts and have conversations with guys like yourself and a good friend. I think a mutual friend of ours is like Ray Cash Care, sure. Bedros Koulian, Mike Chandler. These are all guys that we're friends with mutually. He, he has access to these guys. Like he can... Bro, if I had that when I was 14 years old, I mean, unbelievable. Yes. So what would you, what would you have me do? Okay. What would like people that complain about that? What would you have me do? N not take advantage of those opportunities. <laughs> right. You yeah. know? And so I, I, I do get that occasionally, but I've talked about it so much. And, and I feel like if somebody says that they've got their own mental baggage and I, um, I'm not going to totally maybe to a degree, put that on them, not, not totally because we've been conditioned by our environment uh, and we've been conditioned by the way that we grew up, uh, you know, but at some point you got to let your excuses expire and maybe your mom wasn't around. Maybe your dad was an asshole. Maybe um, you, you were abused as a child. There's a lot of things that could happen and I'm not excusing any of that, but at some point you're a grown ass man or a grown ass woman. And it's time for you to let that excuse expire and say, okay, what do I need to do? to get my life on track. And if you're saying, well, that's easy for you to say because X, Y, and Z, then tell me what it is. And I will give you the exact blueprint. The one that I know anyways, not the only, but the one that I know, I will give you the exact blueprint of what I've done. So you can enjoy the same and reap the same benefits. I have, I'm not trying to hoard that. I want you to experience that. So listen to the podcast, listen to what we share, do what I do. Now, if you're not willing to do it, don't complain to me about not experiencing results. But if you are wanting to experience results, Tony, I know you're about this. I'm about this. Brecken's about this. Let me show you. We'll show you. We'll, we'll, we'll light it all up for you to the best that we can and give you the path that you need to succeed. Yeah. The, the world has created this, this perception that things happen overnight. Like the old joke, you know, uh, you know, after 20 years, I was an overnight success, right? Just the right. You show right. Up, work your ass off. Um, uh, Breck, I want to talk to you a little bit. Uh, the um, I know you love powerlifting and football. You you are into jujitsu, and I remember like like some. I remember texting your dad, going, "What the hell is going on with your your kid?" Because it was like it was so fast. Your metabolism changed from this this. Uh, uh, <laughs> like, you can say it. Throw it out right? there. Yeah, the overweight, overweight. You know, and, and you know, it's interesting because you you talked about in your first podcast, which I thought was so insightful that you had that that intuition because it wasn't like your 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 dad, you know, X mill grappler going, you need to get in shape. It was like it was it was uh, you 
you arrived at a, you and I don't feel good like this. I don't, I'm, my confidence isn't where it could be. And you just knew that and you started to make the change. And so first off, congrats, man. Cause to do that uh, at, at a young age like that and to stay at it and football, jujitsu, uh, powerlifting, but talk a little bit about that. Uh, like that moment. Cause I think that's huge for kids to hear and also for parents, it's, it, it reminds me, uh, one of my kids struggles with, with her weight. And I'm like, I know how bad it is for, for posture, for her knees, for her health. And, and I'll say to my wife, I need to talk. I need to, and she goes, let her, let her find it on her own. Because if it comes from me, just because of who I am, the way, and so we're finding, we're trying to find that balance. So I'm very curious like to talk, like what was that insight? What happened one day you looked in the mirror and you went and something clicked. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it was around when I was 12 or 11, when we just moved up to here where I started noticing it more. Um, I remember the place where I told you that I didn't feel confident with myself. And when we got back home, I was going to start working hard. We were at Popham beach in that Airbnb and we were driving to the gas station and literally this is how the conversation came up while we were riding. When we hit a bump, I'd feel my whole body shake. And that's how it started. I said, I do not feel confident with myself to my dad. And I said, when we get home, I'm going to start working on this. So I, I would eat six snacks a day, sit on the couch, not being active. And, um, so my mom volunteered to take me to the gym, the CrossFit gym. I think I was doing it five times a week, pretty much. And I went to jujitsu twice a night and I was at 153, 154. I dropped down the lowest I got, which was my unhealthiest was 112, I think. Now I'm back at that 153 range. So I've gained that back. And now I'm just working on powerlifting, getting stronger, been doing competitions and it's just crazy. One day it just clicked and I just started grinding and going to the gym and doing jujitsu. I, I, I love that you had that visceral, you felt your, your body wiggle and you went, yeah, that's, that's not for me. Uh, so congrats on that. And uh, thank you. Uh, uh, amazing. Amazing. If you had to, if you had to pick just one powerlifting football or jujitsu, Oh, and I know you, I know you can do all. Jiu-jitsu is third, definitely. I know that breaks your, your two guys' first, heart. Bro. <laughs> <Jiu-jitsu's> Sorry. <first. laughs> um, I do jiu-jitsu probably third place, uh, football second, and then powerlifting first. That's what I would have guessed. But That's what I would have guessed. Powerlifting is benefiting me for football season. So right. those two go together pretty good. And it, and it will. What do you like about powerlifting? Sorry, I was just going to go. what what is it that you like about powerlifting so much relative to the others? I have no clue. I just like lifting heavy weight. All, all my buddies that go to the high school and middle school here, my coach has formed a group of 10 to 12 of us young men. And we go to the gym three times a week and we do the three big le- uh, lifts. We do accessories. We do turf work, preparing us for sports. And it's just, I don't even know why. I just like it so That's much. Coach like, Moore. what do you like about jujitsu? <laughs> I yeah. See, you, it's, it's, it's hard so to weird. explain. Yeah, yeah. You just you just love it. You just you just find it kind of intuitively, and yeah. um, the things about it you can't really explain, but it just calls to you, draws to you, and so you yeah. just you just dive into it mm-hmm. head first. Yeah, good question. You you, you find it. You 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 find it, and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's great that it's great that you have that the powerlifting thing is, uh, amazing. My, my son, Nick, who's 30 now is, a uh, a lifting coach, a fitness coach, uh, dabbles in all stuff from CrossFit to Olympic to all of that. Uh, and, um, and so it's neat. Just, he's huge now. So he, he reminds me, you know, there, there was a period, I got pictures of him when he first started where he's like, you know, like this big and, and now, you know, he stands up next to me and I'll make some joke about going, uh, I'll pick you up. I'll throw you in the pool and he'll smile and I'll go, okay, let's just say go. <laughs> and, uh, 
I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the kitchen and get a snack. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, he's huge. Well, and that's why, like, I, I understand angles. So I'm, you know, I boosted my seat a little higher. I'm sitting right. a little bit more, more far forward. But if we're, you sit down like a normal person. <laughs> um, if we're sitting there side by side, you can see that this kid's sitting just as tall as I am. So yeah. it's, um, it's pretty wild to see how big this guy's getting, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. The, the power yeah, lifting, definitely and, and, of pride. and he'll come back to, you know, you'll always be involved in, you know, shooting and bow and, and, and sure. striking sure. stuff like that. You know, for, for me, I love the martial art journey. Just, I, I, I think uh, men and women need to know that if they had to defend themselves against another predator human that that they've got something in their mind that goes I, like i know more about this than most other people and they'll do something well yeah. so so him and i actually had an experience this was about i think this was not last winter but the winter before we had pulled up to the gas station and i'm the gas the, the gas pump in front of me was out of order so i didn't pull all the way up i just i left that one open and i and i uh pulled up to the second gas pump um and there was some snowmobilers that came in behind oh, us yeah. and you know i saw them come in i didn't think anything of it they're just gonna fill up with gas or whatever and brecken all of a sudden is like hey those guys are yelling at you and i'm like at me what and i look back and sure enough like one of the guys there was two of them and two snowmobiles. And one of the guys was like profanity, you know, just like bl blatantly like profane cussing, cussing and dropping the F-bomb and whatnot. Throwing his helmet. I think he threw his helmet. Yeah, like he was worked up. And he, I, I think he yelled, I think what, one thing I caught, if I remember right, he was like, you effer, like, why didn't you pull forward or whatever? And like, they whipped their snowmobiles around my truck and pulled into the gas pump in front of me, which is the one that was out of order. Right. And they, I think they were upset from what I gathered that I didn't pull all the way forward. Yeah. But like, why would I, they, because they couldn't see the pump they was out of order. They didn't know it was out of order and they just. Yeah. Lost and so head. instead of just being civil, normal people about it, they decided to be disgusting, you know, pro profane kind of assholes. Mm -hmm. And, and I opened my truck door and the guy, when the guy got out off his snowmobile and he's, instead of coming to my side, he started to walk around to Brecken's side. And he was what, 10, 11 years old. I'm like, nah, not, yeah. we're not having any of that. So I started to open my door and like that moment hit me. I'd been training jujitsu pretty solid for uh, about two, two and a half years, like solid, like four or five days a week. And I felt pretty confident with my skill set that way anyways, relative to probably 90 plus percent of the population. And I, I, I thought for sure, I'm going to have to kick the shit out of this guy. Yeah. Um, and I opened the door and I'm like, I yelled at him and I said, Hey man, like get away from my truck. And he starts to go over to the other side. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like, do I really need to get into this altercation? Like so far, you know, he's, he's pissing all over the place, but like, he's, that's really it. Like he's just trying to mark his territory. He's not really at this point threatening anything. So I said, Hey man, the pump's out of order. Like I would have pulled up the pump's out of order. Just like, go get your gas or whatever. I'll get my gas. No big deal. Yeah. And his friend was kind of like sheepishly looking down because he knew how big of an asshole his buddy looked. <laughs> yeah. right. And so his buddy was like, bro, this is embarrassing, you know? And, and I said, Hey man, like, I don't, I'm not interested in getting into it with you. Like I'm, I'm going to be done here in a minute and you get, get gas. No big deal. But like, why in the world will we get up this upset over gas? And so him and his buddy, once they realized that that pump was out of order, they kind of sheepishly walked off and I didn't get out of my truck because I mean, I don't know, that guy could have had a gun or a knife or, you know, something. And I'm going to die over trying to fill up gas in front of my son. Right. That's retarded. Yeah. But, but also I was fairly confident in my skill. And I realized at that moment that that level of confidence is actually what kept me out of an altercation. Yeah. Because if I didn't have that level of confidence in my physical ability, I probably would have tried to prove myself um, or pounded on my chest a bit more. And who knows what that could have escalated to in front of my kid. Yeah. Right. And instead, I was definitive. Um, I didn't 
back down. I didn't wimp out. I was definitive. I was clear. I gave instruction, but I re- I, I made it clear that I was not interested in escalating this altercation, you know, and it worked out fine. You know, like he yelled at us. It was kind of silly. It's a kind yeah, of a funny thing yeah. now to think about. Um, he and his buddy probably felt ridiculous as they should have. Mm-hmm. And they went and they got gas and I got gas and they went on about their day and hopefully had a good time snowmobiling. We went on about our day doing whatever we needed to do. Yeah. But I think it was that, that level of confidence in my own abilities that kept me and him out of that altercation. Cause I had no need or desire to prove myself. Like, who are you? I don't need to prove myself to you. Mm-hmm. I go train four or five days a week with some, literally some killers. Like I don't yeah. need to prove myself and I'm not interested in doing that. So there's a real advantage outside of being capable in the physical aspect um, to knowing and being capable of defending yourself. Cause it, I think a lot of times it will just keep you out of the, those environments because I realize, and you know, you saw the, the, the bruise on my bicep, you know, I realized to a degree there's consequences. Like there's some real world shit. There's consequences to this game. And those of us who are familiar, at least to some degree, and I know you are more than I am for sure, but some degree of familiarity with violence, you realize fully the consequence of the decisions that we make. And I'm most of the time, there are some times like at another scenario where uh, somebody tried to break into the house where I, where I would have done what needed to be done, you know, but I, I'm so not so I'm, I'm familiar enough that I realize what's worth fighting over and what isn't. And that wasn't one of them, but that comes from my training. Yeah. I right. felt, I felt really nervous when you opened that door. I was, I was nervous for him, nervous for me, but I, I knew he was confident with himself going to the gym five times a week. I knew he was confident and he'd, he'd do what he needed to. But when that guy started coming over to my side, I think I pulled my knife out cause I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh. And just watching them. I was, I was thinking in my head what moves I could put on them in that situation, just kind of planning it out in my head. And I think my dad was doing the same thing too. That's, that's uh, super interesting. And, and uh, you know, as somebody who studied violence, fear, and aggression for four decades, um, the, the missing element for most people is understanding what we call the timeline of violence. And, and it's kind of like a mental blueprint of you know, it's violence isn't getting out of a headlock and violence isn't blocking a kick or throwing a punch. It's picking up the pre-contact cues, the energetic, something's off here, something's wrong. Is this guy drunk or, or, or uh, uh, insane? Is he just angry? And then there's, there's specific strategies for de-escalation and avoidance that are different strategies from the physical, but, uh, what you're describing, uh, Ryan, and even bracketing what you were doing, <clears throat> you know, the old maxim, the pen is mightier than the sword. And, and that sort of maxim says like, hey, fighting doesn't solve everything, write a nice letter or, or talk it out. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. junior that. So I look at that and, 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 and I added another sentence to it. I said, I wrote, the pen is mightier than the sword when you know how to use a sword, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. In other words, you're doing your jujitsu, you're doing your striking, your Muay Thai, your Krav Maga, whatever it is. And the, but the key thing here is this, and this is something that is uh, kudos to both your personalities, but also the men and women that you train with, because there's the, like the Karate Kid, there's the Cobra Kai's out there where you learn the stuff and, and it amplifies you being a jerk. Let's do something. Let's show these people how good they are. Uh, and that's part of the culture that you train with. So when you understand the, the consequences that you can tear your bicep, just having a friendly grappling match, that you can zig when you should have zagged and bust your nose with your buddy or knock out a tooth or get a thumb in the eye and realize, holy shit, there's consequences even when you're practicing. That's going to be 10x in the real world, especially in a litigious pussified society where every fucker is filming stuff and and cnn's going to edit stuff it's like you said is, is this the fight i'm going to commit all my resources to because i might lose everything also uh, it's way beyond the ego so so yeah 
knowing so the, the message here and obviously I'm, I'm biased on this know how to protect yourself and know how to protect your family that's knowing how to use the sword and then it's like okay can i avoid this can i de-escalate this and always invest in that and then it's the old line from uh, i'm sure both of you have seen the original roadhouse one of the greatest lines reckon have you seen roadhouse with patrick swayze the movie you know you gotta it. watch it um but there's a line in there where he says he's, he's teaching people how to handle doors. He's a, he's a famous street fighter doorman. And uh, two lines that his girlfriend in the movie says, you, so you've never lost a fight, how is that? You know, and she's like, like, like thinking he's smug. How, oh, you've never lost a fight? And he says, because those people who go looking for trouble are never quite as prepared as those who are prepared for trouble or waiting for trouble. Mm, yeah. And it's subtle. And then his other famous line is be nice until it's time to not be nice. <laughs> and, exactly. uh, um, but uh, very cool hey I want to be respectful of your time I know I know you're super super busy and we can we can do this more uh, 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 the reckon let me let, let's sort of wind things down with uh, I'm going to put you on the on, on the spot here you've talked about this a little bit more but what is it you saw in your dad at some point, you're watching the business, you're helping, you know, oh, look, we sold a hat, putting in a box, oh, look, a book. What is it you saw where, like my, we had a family business, I never went to our business and watched my dad work, and I never said, uh, I wanna run this business. I wanna, I wanna be involved in, that never happened to me. You know, I've got a cool business. My son never said to me, I want to be in your business, right? What is it you see in your dad and the business that speaks to you that you went, I, I, I want to be involved and, and, and I want to help this thing grow? The thing I saw in my dad uh, to be in this business was he gave me the opportunity to work in his store and I'm still doing that, which I love. And I'm able to earn money and invest in things I love. But the thing that really clicked for me is my dad is not doing this for himself, maybe a little bit, but he's told me, I've heard it on the podcast. He says, anything I'm do, I benefit it for my family, for me, my siblings, my mom, and for the business and the people who are listening to this podcast. It's not for my dad, it's for the people. So that's what really made me want to hop on board with this. So cool, man. It's so cool. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited for you guys, and I'm glad, uh, although we live far away, I'm sure I'll meet you soon. I was, I was really thinking, you know, I grew up on the East Coast, and I used, to, I used to camp in Maine every summer for most of my life. We would drive down from Montreal, and we'd stay, uh, you know, Maine, Agunquit, Kennebunk, uh, yeah, yeah. Saratoga, like all the, and um uh, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come out and visit you guys. Uh, just we'd to, love uh, to have you. Yeah, open awesome. invitation to come spend yeah, time. Thank with you. Us. Uh, but I was thinking about that today in preparing uh, for the talk, and uh, just what a, what a what a beautiful part uh, of the world. And and you know, as much as I love, I always wanted to live in California, and I finally, you know, there was a dream I had as a, as a kid, and I moved here when I turned fifty. Uh, but I miss the four seasons and I, and I miss, uh, there, there's, uh, there's that East coast in, in, in my blood at a, at a cellular level. Um, but the, uh, I want to, again, like I said, mindful of your time, we'll have you back on again, anything, anything you need, anything I can do to help, uh, uh, just reach out, man. Um, I'm. We don't know each other, Breck, and we just met, but I'm super inspired and proud of you. And 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 Ryan, as a as a 61 year old uh, dad, you know, I, I shared in, in the beginning, and I've shared a little bit privately in, in text messages. Um, I'm super proud of you too, man. And what what you're doing, you. you inspired me. You inspired zillions of people, and hopefully, sharing your story we can we can help and it's not save people because i think the world needs saving now i mean this is this is the craziest time to be alive the shit that's going on 
and and this message of a strong family and get your shit together and be able to protect yourself and get your get your your focus and get your finances and, and learn how to fight right uh uh that at a metaphor and and an actual factual level could not be more relevant than it is today but um if you guys have anything else you want to share or anything that that uh you wish i'd asked you know let's let's uh let's let's spray that to the group I, I would say I would say one thing you said this is a crazy time to be alive and it, and it certainly is there's a lot going wrong and there's a lot of issues that we need to deal with societally and at a personal level, but it's also the best time to be alive, you know our access to information our access to resources to other good people to abundance to wealth to medical care to all of these other things sure. is unparalleled in any other time in history, and so if you aren't experiencing what you want to experience in life. Um, it's, there's no excuses. Like there really, there really isn't, you know, we could say the president is this and that, uh, we could say the economy is poor. We could say, uh, whatever you can come up with any excuse in the book, but as long as you live in this country, the United States and also abroad, not every country exclusively, but like I said, unparalleled than any other time in history. So we really have to do a better job of letting go of the excuses. That's not to say we need to pull the wool over our eyes. I see that there's things wrong in society. And so I do something about it. And I tap into the resources that I didn't frankly earn that somebody else 200 or 500 or 100 or 50 years ago earned for me. And we have a moral obligation to utilize those resources in a way that's going to serve ourselves and serve our families and serve the people that frankly cannot serve themselves. Um, so let's not get so trapped into the victimhood mentality that permeates much of society and social media and realize that although there are problems with the world and there are issues that need to be addressed, their resources are abundant and we can and should take advantage of those resources to make the world a better place. Great reframe. Reckon, what, what would you tell uh, 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 a thousand, 15, 16, 17 year olds that are gonna be listening to this because maybe their dad or mom said, hey, would you, would you spend an hour and listen to this? What message would you have for teens? When my dad was on his podcast with Tim Tebow, this one gets me every time, but uh, he said, I've, I've seen people on their dying beds and I asked them, what if they could do it again, what would they do? And all of them said, I'd spend more time with my family and love my family more. So it's, it's way better spend time with your family, cut out time for them instead of video games and all this other crap. Spend time with your family because it goes by fast. Amazing. Amazing, dude. Hey, you guys, you guys are, 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 are truly inspiring. I'm grateful to know you both. I look forward to uh, seeing you in person uh, uh, sooner than later. And uh, thank you so much for your time, guys. Thank you, thank brother. You. Appreciate the opportunity, man. Good to know you. And what an honor it is to join you, especially with my son, man. This is, yeah. this is a cool. Super, super cool. Super cool. Okay, guys, um, have a great day and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, brother. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Hang on a sec.